Aloha Kako. Welcome to Live from Noir Lab Eclipse Edition. My name is Jamika Marshall, and I am an outreach assistant at the International Gemini Observatory, a program of NSF's Noir Lab. Today, I will be your moderator, and we will be discussing solar eclipse. This is our special edition, Eclipse Edition. So those of you in our YouTube audience, please remember that if you have any questions or comments, you can leave them in the YouTube chat and I will read them aloud for our guests to answer. Now, we are of course today celebrating one year since the July 2nd, 2019 solar eclipse. So before we move on uh, to a few news updates, let's introduce our three science, um, our three science guests today. Uh, normally, of course, we have uh, a science guest and a um, host and moderator, but for this special edition, you are treated to three guests. And we will start with, one Sigel. So, Juan is a civil mechanical engineer from the University of Concepcion with 18 years of experience in the area of applied, uh, uh, in the area of engineered applied to the field of astronomy in the optical range and the development and implementation of educational tools in the area um, of educational tools in the area of teaching science and technology for teachers and students. He was site testing engineer um, for TMT, that's the 30 meter telescope, and LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which uh, is now um, the Vera Rubin Observatory, where he developed tools and applications for control, monitoring, and acquisition of meteorological and astronomical data. He is currently a science education specialist at the NSF's NOR Lab, Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in La Serena, Chile. Welcome, Juan. Hello, Yamika. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Okay, our second science guest today is uh, going to be Manuel Paredes. And there we have Manuel. So um, Manuel is a journalist from Chile with a wide range of experience in documenting and producing visual content about astronomy, engineering processes, and technical milestones related to telescopes. Originally based in Santiago as a reporter for Agency News and other news agencies, he currently lives in La Serena supporting communications as a media expert for NSF's Noir Lab. And he also leads the education and engagement efforts in Chile. He is the author of the first book about astrophotography in Chile, uh, which was financed by the Chilean Ministry of Culture and Arts. And he is currently preparing a new book. Welcome, Manuel. Hi, Jamiga. Thanks. Hello, everyone. And our third guest is Robert Sparks. So Robert Sparks is currently a science education specialist at NSF's NOR Lab in Tucson. He taught high school physics, math, and astronomy for 11 years before joining NOR Lab. He received the 2001-2002 Fermilab Teacher Fellowship, where he worked on developing educational materials for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. He has been honing his astrophotography skills under the dark Arizona skies. And on the weekends, he can be found performing at the Unscrewed Theater. Okay, welcome, Rob. 
Thank you. Okay, so um, now let's turn it over to Juan Seguil, who will give us, he's gonna tell us a little bit about Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory, or is also known as CTIO. Juan, tell us a bit about CTIO. Okay, thank you, Yamika. Well, um, Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory, CTIO, is a, a complex of astronomical telescopes and instrument located in uh, 80 kilometers to east of La Serena in Chile and an altitude of 2,200 meters. Uh, Tololo, the name of Tololo, means in the Aguita language in front of the abyss. The principal telescope is the four meter Victor Blanco telescope. And this telescope, this telescope shares the summit with other 35 telescope from range from uh, three centimeters to uh, four meters. Um, as a curiosity, the smaller telescope on the summit of Cerro Tololo have a mirror of 2.8 centimeters and is the only one that worked during the day. This is the GONG, the global oscillation, part of the global oscillation network. It's a solar telescope actually of NSO, the National Solar Observatory. Yeah. Um, the complex is part of the National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory, NORIC Lab, along with uh, the 8.1 Gemini South Telescope, the 4.1 Southern Astrophysical Research SOAR Telescope, and the 8.4 meter Vera C. Rubin Telescope that are or in the uh, Aura property here in, in Chile. The, the last telescope that I mentioned are actually in Cerro Pachon that is in front of Cerro Tololo, just 10 kilometers uh, from Cerro Tololo. Uh, uh, Lab, our complex is operated by Association of University for Research in Astronomy, Aura, which also operate this, the Space Telescope Science Institute and the Gemini Observatory here in Chile and also in Hawaii. And on the, on the second slide, if you want to know um, the live, a live image, this is from just a couple of hours ago because now it's, it's completely dark here uh, in, in Chile. It's actually 7, 10 p.m. local time in Chile. And this is how it looks like the site now. We have a a few snow uh, two, uh, let's see, two days ago on Monday. So if you want to check uh, how uh, our webcam, you can Google our live webcam of Cerro Tololo on Google. Excellent. Thank you very much, Juan. You're welcome, Javika. Before we begin our discussion on the 2019 solar eclipse, I would like to first highlight some uh, recent NORLAB science news. Um, and so on this upcoming slide, you will have a treat here to our most recent CosmoView um, video. So astronomers have discovered the most distant quasar ever found using the International Gemini Observatory and Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory, both programs of NSF's NOIR lab. It is also the very first quasar to receive an indigenous Hawaiian name, Po Noua Ena. Now, this quasar contains a monster black hole, twice the mass of the black hole um, in the only other quasar found at, in the same epoch, which is, of course, challenging the current theories of supermassive black hole formation and growth in the early universe. Now, after more uh, than a decade of searching for the first quasars, uh, this team of astronomers using the NOR Labs uh, Gemini Observatory and CTIO uh, to discover the most massive quasar known in the early universe um, was detected from a time 
only 700 million years after the Big Bang. Now, for those of you who do not know, quasars are the most energetic objects in the universe, and they're powered by their supermassive black holes. And since their discovery, astronomers have been keen to determine when they first appeared in our cosmic history. Uh, for more information, I will have the link to the press release and video in the description below, um, below our uh, video today. All right, so now let's turn it over to Juan, who's going to begin today's discussion on last year's solar eclipse. Juan. Thank you, Yamika. Uh, hello again. Um, I'm going to start uh, up talking about uh, our education and engagement effort for the solar eclipse 2019. And I'm going to start uh, talking uh, where we are first uh, in order to contextualize, uh, contextualize the territory, which we're going to talk about this afternoon. So here at the left, you see, so, sorry, at the right, you see uh, a map where is Chile in red and it, we are in South America. And uh, this, uh, our facility is located in the region of Coquimbo, which is the fourth region of in, in Chile. It's um, in, in the, at, the, at the left, you're going to see now a, a map of where is La Serena and Coquimbo, Vicuña, and in the next uh, um, image, you're going to see uh, where is our facility. There is our, the red dot point show where is our facility, 80 kilometers uh, east of La Serena, or the port of, of the port of Coquimbo and La Serena City. Um, this, by the way, this is Pacific Ocean, and the Andes is just right, right here, to the right of our site. So, um, this is where we are located, and this is the area where uh, the the eclipse of 2019 happened uh, a year ago. So um, next slide. So let's let's um, talk about a little bit about the history of the total eclipse in this territory because since uh, um, uh, fifteen uh, century, uh, just a few eclipses, total solar eclipses, happened in this area. Uh, Fifteen eighty three. 1590, uh, 1839, and 1893. So the last total eclipse here, the, the solar eclipse here, uh, was 126 years ago. So there is no memory in the people about a similar event. So this is something to consider when you do some uh, education and engagement activities. So next slide, please, Rob. So as a, as a group, uh, as an education, engagement, and communication group, uh, we meet together at the end of 2016 to, to form an internal task force to first prepare ourselves, because we are not, we, at that time, we were not experts on Eclipse. So, we need to prepare material uh, and our expertise to train our local communities for this event. So we decide some that will we decide what will be our goals for the next two years. And you see now on the on the screen, this uh, this our goals: provide accurate information about the solar eclipse was was one of them. Educate about safe observation of the sun, the use of sunglass, special uh, solar glasses for 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 to see the, the the event, provide accurate and accessible information to local authorities for logistic coordination. This also was very important that I'm going to talk about 
later in the uh, on the next slides. Provide also a platform for signs during the eclipse and take advantage of the eclipse to extract aura identity. This was our goals, principal goals in education and engagement um, from 2016, 2000, uh, actually 2020. Um, so next slide, please. So the, the eclipse, our, our, our eclipse uh, happened in, in the north part of, of the region of Coquimbo. As uh, you see on the right, La Serena and Coquimbo, uh, our observatory is just below the red line uh, of, the, of the center of the eclipse. And uh, this particular event took place uh, at, at a special time. Could you, yeah, thank you, Rob. So the eclipse start at 1523, totality 1638, and the end of totality 1641. Sunset was, was at 555, 57. So totality was two minutes and 36 seconds. So the local circumstance of this eclipse was very particular, was almost near the sunset. So the sun was very low in the, over the horizon, above the horizon. So um, this implied um, another problem because uh, our area, if you live in the, near the beach, there's no problem because you don't have hills in front, but if you live in the valley where you have the, the Andes mountain, you may be in troubles to see this eclipse. Please go to the next slide to show an example. So you need, uh, and we need to be very careful to select what sites or which site people use to see the clips, especially in inside the valley. Um, for example, here I have two, two examples of a of view using a tool. Um, you see the, uh, uh, to, for example, on the, on the bottom, you see that the sun was blocked by the hill at the time of the eclipse. And on the, on the, on the image that is up, you see this, the sun that is at the time of the, of the eclipse is, the sun is completely visible and no, uh, uh, at the hill cannot cover the, the sun. So this is very important. So with this extra, um, problem add to the clips, we need to train our local communities and our our guesses in, in, in the area. So please, the next slide. So uh, we, in the past, we will, uh, our, our, the, the Astro Tourist Guide our, was our priority in, in the area. You know, the region of Coquimbo is one of the places where observatories, our facilities, scientific observatories are, but no, we are not alone. There are other two uh, sites, Las Campanas and La Silla, one of from ISO and the other one for Carnegie that have uh, places here to the, where they run science uh, from uh, the region of Coquimbo. So there are major uh, scientific observatories here in, in, in the area of the region of Coquimbo. And also from, I believe from the last 25 years, they, are, they are, have been growing the local touristic observatories. Um, we have been involved in the training on astro tourist guides um, in, in astronomy, and also to use new tools to improve um, their their service, um, and with the with the clips in mind, we we also train the astro tourist guys of our region. Uh, we we did a, a a big effort to train them, and also to to understand the local circumstance of the clips. You know the the hills, for example, that can block the sun. So we used to for with them this. Uh, reality, uh, what we call it, uh, augmented reality tools, 
to uh, uh, test sites to where tourists can see the the, the solar eclipse in the inside in the, inside the valleys. So uh, we train many many uh, tourist guys uh, in 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 the area, and we train also new generations of a tourist guide in other places. For example, we usually do um, we did in the past. Uh, training only in the Elki Valley, but uh, with the clips in mind, we did it in the other valleys that are part of the region of Coquimbo, like the Choapa Valley and also the Limari Valley. So we did a lot, a, a big effort in 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 from 2016, uh, 17, and 18 to train this tourist guide in um, the the clips and the solar solar clips. Uh, next slide, please. Also, teachers and students are part of our normal education and engagement activities. Uh, we we include the in the clips in all our talks and workshops. Um, also, in the in our local community events that we did in this two or three years period of time. Uh, I personally did more than 150 talks and training personally to, to people. So I, I actually train near five to 6,000 people during this time. Uh, so we did a, a big effort in the area and during this, this period of time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we, we also support the local government agency. Um, one of the, our first um, uh, training was done to municipalities. Talk with the mayors. Talk with the the um, the personnel that will be in charge of activities related with the clips, and, and and we did that. We started two years in advance with that. Also, we was involved with Cernatur. Cernatur is part is is the national tourist service here in Chile. So. Uh, we train them also, and we participate with them in different activities. Uh, also, we, we support the local government of the region of Coquimbo with talks and also um, where there are um, questions and our expertise in this, in this area. Seremias, uh, all the local uh, representative of the, of the government here in, in, for example, environment office, um, education office. So we, we, we work very close with all these um, government agency during this period of time. Um, next slide. But also in our goals was science, uh, science during the clips. And we, we provide a, actually a platform for science during the clips. Uh, we, we did a call for proposal. Uh, that NSO, the National Solar Observatory, lead the evaluation, and we select we select five groups. Uh, these are the groups that were selected. Uh, that's the group that was at the site of Cerro Tololo the day of the eclipse, um, doing science because we are uh, a science observatory, uh, so we have to provide a, a platform for 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 this event, and. I want to end my presentation uh, with the um, with us with a video. It's a short video of, of three minutes that show um, that this video this video was done by Julio Avila and the team of the Association of Regional Television Channel here in Chile.
Thank you, Juan. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, if it's all right, I'd like to jump in here before Manuel uh, begins to share a few comments from our YouTube audience. Um, we have uh, a couple of comments here. Um, the first one is from uh, Michael Mosby. Michael Mosby from Memphis, Tennessee says, this is a great video. The image of the eclipse is amazing. Um, then we have uh, another participant, T, I believe this is Bowden. I apologize if I mispronounce your name, uh, but uh, says the close-up of the corona in the video was absolutely gorgeous one. Thank you. Uh, and then we have uh, greetings from Camila. Hi, everyone. My greetings for Juan Manuel and Rob. All right. And so... Um, without further ado, we will move on to Manuel Paredes. Manuel. Hi, everyone. Well, my name is Manuel Paredes, and I work for Noilab as the as a outreach manager in Chile. And in this position, I support communications, education, and engagement for NSF's Noilab. Uh, well, during last year, uh, to contribute with all the activities related to the eclipse, I work as uh, as an eclipse event project manager. Um, well, this part of the presentation is about the communications, all the plan of, plan of communications that we uh, prepare and implement uh, last year. So just give me one second. Okay, from the beginning, we knew that this event, the eclipse, the total solar eclipse was a unique event and very important for an international organization like the Association of Universities for Research and Astronomy, and of course for the Region of Coquimbo. Next slide, please. So in, in this way, we prepare a two year plan that actually we start to meet in 2016 to talk and discuss how we were going to work to face the year of the eclipse in, in, our, in our area. So we develop a plan that consider the recognition first of aura as a benchmark of high quality, of high quality for astronomical and scientific information and also as an organization commit with local education, local students, and of course, the public. As our safety standards are extremely high amid its facilities, therefore, safety eye viewing was an essential concern of all our communications regarding to the eclipse. Next slide, please. And from 2017, two years before the eclipse, Aura has a plan that consider two main phases. The first one, annual activities related to the eclipse, and the second one, the event on the day of the eclipse. Next slide, please. Our communications, education, and engagement group prepare then and coordinate different activities like workshops and presentations, a web page that was the first web page uh, prepared or developed in Chile about the clips. We were um, uh, aware about media relations, how we will relate and, 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 and uh, uh, communicate with with medias, uh, and we have a, a, a specific and um, special stamp of the eclipse in all our public events. And of course, we also focus on supporting local authorities as one mentions, ma mentioned previously. The next slide, please, Rob. And so, well, we offer a lot of workshops, a lot of talks and presentations like one said, 
uh, and, and in, 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 in different areas and in different places uh, and with, with different presenters from our observatories. And we reach more than 10,000 students, teachers, and touristic operators in this, in this way. The next slide, please. So we also produced the first web page in Chile dedicated completely, completely to the total solar eclipse that includes a countdown and also uh, offering the possibility to connect with the Exploratorium live stream event the day of the eclipse. And also we put a lot of uh, information in this web page for students, for teachers, uh, for media and for general public. The next slide, please. So, as I said, the website was our repository of key products for anyone who wanted to know specific things about the clips. For example, how to observe it safely using indirect, indirect viewing devices that the students will be able to elaborate, to fabricate using, for example, an envelope and a mirror or a serial box. The next, please. At this website, we also post a series of graphics products with useful information about the clips. For example, infographics like the ones that you are looking now, as well as a gallery of spectacular images of the sun and other eclipses that was uh, granted by the National Solar Observatory. Thanks, Rob. The next slide, please. And of course, we have to. We we were aware that we have to take advantage of this opportunity and have a good relationship with uh, journalists and media. So for media and journalists, we offer a press kit with all the content necessary to build any kind of information about the clips, including text, videos, audios, still images, interviews, etc. A lot of things that jur and journalists only have to access to this online press kit to prepare the article or what they need to uh, support their own communications in their own media. The next slide, please. Uh, well, in this way, we also invite a group of local journalists to participate in a workshop about the clips offered to journalists and of course publishers. And in this image, in this photo, you can see a group of local journalists here in La Serena and Coquimbo who participate in this, in this workshop and they are pausing in the in the Gemini uh, control room in the base facility. Next slide, please. And also we plan a strategy using social media to disseminate important messages regarding the eclipse. And of course, with a purpose, with the aim to increase the engagement and of course the number of followers in our uh, social media channels. The next slide, please. We have, every year we have several public annual events. And uh, that year, the, the, the last year, the, the year of the clips, we use our annual programming to take advantage of the large number of people who participate in these public events uh, that we offer every year in La Serena and the surroundings. In this way, we were able to amplify the scope of our communications and, and reach. The next one, please. And of course, the clips was a great opportunity to motivate the interest in scientific and astronomy related career in STEM careers which is in line with, with, the, um, with the education and engagement policies that we have. And for this reason also, it was a huge opportunity to create uh, a really brand awareness around Aura and its programs. 
in addition to increase the interaction with our local audiences. The next one, please. Uh, well, well, Juan mentioned this. Uh, I, I would mention also because it's inside our plan of communications, we were able to strengthen our links with governmental and public organizations. Since we provide critical information, they use to be prepared for the huge amount of visitors that visit the area during the eclipse. The next Juan, one. I'm sorry, Manuel. Sure. Can I jump in here with a few questions from our YouTube audience, if that's okay? Sure, that's okay. Fantastic. Um, so we have a question from Liz Flemings, and she asks, when and where was the first solar eclipse documented? Oh, well, well, I, I don't know if Juan knows that, that information. Um. I don't know if she's referring to our in, in Chile, for example, or in general in the world. Uh, uh, just in general, when was the first solar eclipse that we actually uh, were able to, to see and we knew it was going to happen? That we knew as an eclipse and not as an unusual phenomena. <laughs> we could come back to it if 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 can. yeah i think so i i i i think was um uh with in with the greeks but i have to check that or maybe with the i if i remember well with the babylons yeah okay that... I, I, i'll be back with the with the with the with the answer okay that sounds amazing juan and uh we also have um a few comments um Again, from uh, Michael Mosby, it says, it looks like these, these events have turned out to have great turnout, which is amazing. And um, he's excited that people are interested in learning about um, eclipses. And we do also have a, another question, was well, kind of a comment, uh, and this is to all of the guests about the solar glasses, the glasses that we see everyone wearing for uh, safely viewing the solar eclipse. Now, I know here um, in, on the Big Island, most people were pretty aware of the need to wear protective lenses uh, to view the eclipse. Um, one and Manuel, Rob, in your experiences, um, did you find uh, that most people, even if they hadn't viewed a solar eclipse before, knew that they needed to use some type of protective uh, lenses that were not sunglasses? Yeah, well, well, I don't know who wants to answer that question. I. I it's think that well, it's it's very important to, yeah. Uh, well, it's very important to use uh, the uh, 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 a real protection for your eyes. Uh, I mean, the the regular the regular sunglasses uh, they don't work very well for your eye protection when you view direct to the sun. So you need to you need to um, uh, be aware that you, when you are looking at the eclipse or the sun directly, you need to consider um, the, to use uh, a special glasses, special solar glasses to view the, the, the sun. Um, uh, this, I, I don't remember what is the ISO, the, the ISO number, Juan. Do you remember what is the ISO number for, for these uh, solar glasses? If not, it's okay. We can definitely add it uh, information into the chat uh, at the end one. Because we're definitely having a lot of interest. So thank you, Manuel, please continue. <laughs> thank you. Sure. Uh, well, can, Rob, could you move the next, to, the, to the next slide, please? All right, thanks. Well, 
Uh, due to this intense work, we obtained several advantages for the organization. Uh, the most important of them was the possibility to create brand awareness regarding Aura and, of course, all the telescope that uh, Aura and Aura Lab has here in Chile, like CDIO, um, Gemini, SOAR, uh, the, Vera, the Vera Rubin one. Uh, next slide, please. So we, we knew that this event will be a global showcase for us. So we made every effort to take advantage of this opportunity. And we obtained, we got results that was really amazing for us. Yeah, according to media, to the media monitoring company, so to one media monitoring company, uh, the name of, for example, Aura and, and Tololo had a reach of almost uh, 330 Three, 3 million people between June the 28th and July the 2nd of 2019. So uh, that's only because of internet pub publication related to the eclipse. And the next slide, please. And of, of course, in a similar way, way, our funding agency, the National Science Foundation, of the, United, of the United States had a reach of uh, 166.7 million people in the same period of time, uh, mainly due to articles and news regarding the clips that mentioned this uh, important organization for us. The next slide, please. And of course, the day of the eclipse the, on July 2nd, last year, we prepare an event in Cerro de Lolo, in the summit of Cerro de Lolo, uh, amid all the, the domes of, uh, of the observatory. And it was attended by important stakeholders for our observatories, such as representative of the National Science Foundation, for example. Uh, but also we received an important group of scientists who made several observations of solar science, as Juan mentioned before, and also other stakeholders that are uh, local stakeholders that are important, and of course, uh, media. The next slide, please. And that day, we also received several TV stations, medias, journalists, photographers and also a small team from Exploratorium that had the mission to broadcast the eclipse, uh, the eclipse worldwide. And well, I think that's, that's all I can say. Uh, the next slide is a video that Rob Sparks will present. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. This is a video. It's a, it's a time lapse. It's about double speed. I'll start playing it. Taken by Pete Merritt. Whoops, wrong button there. I hit the, got to start the video. There we go. Now it started. This is taken by Pete Merenfeld of Noir Lab. Uh, it's a, taken from a drone over CTI over the eclipse. It's about double speed because totality lasts about one minute here instead of a little over two minutes we had at CTIO. But as you watch in the distance here, watch the sky start darkening. You see a sort of U-shaped shadow approaching you as the eclipse comes. And I love this effect right here. Being on a mountain, you get to see this effect. There comes that U-shaped shadow as the sky darkens, and soon you'll be engulfed by totality. This is my third solar eclipse, but first one in the mountains, so on a mountain. So the first one I actually got to see that shadow approach and really feel like you're being engulfed by the shadow. And there we are now in totality. If you look to the lower left of the moon, you'll actually see Venus came out. So that's a Venus just above the horizon in that shadow there. So watch the shadow as the totality goes on. You'll see it start sort of moving to the left and becoming more asymmetric as the moon's shadow goes across. It's not a sort of twilight effect all around the horizon. We're only looking at one direction here, but if we had a 360 view, you'd see that twilight behind you as well. So it's sort of like there's a sunset engulfing you on all sides. So it's not quite night. It's not quite day. It's a separate 
phase of time and watch the shape of that moon's shadow changing because we're coming toward the end of totality here. <clears throat> you see on the left, Venus is coming out of that shadowed area now, which means we are approaching the second diamond ring as the moon starts uncovering the sun. Except this is about double speed, so we all had about twice as much time totality as this video depicts here. Pete just uh, sped it up a little bit to make it a little bit faster, and Venus is totally out of the shadow now. You can still see it. You actually see Venus during the day, even not during an eclipse, if you know where to look. And that, as much, there's the second diamond ring as the shadow starts retreating into the distance, and uh, the light starts returning from the sun. So I think this is just a wonderful video Pete did from a drone uh, above CTIO, right by the four meter telescope. He also has a neat picture, which you can look in the uh, in this video's post, look in the comments for this video. There's a neat picture he did from this drone of a composite where he took several images of the uh, sun in this position so you can see it. It's a really neat image. We'll post our Flickr pool in the uh, uh, notes with this video when it gets posted and processed. But now it's my turn. So I'm gonna talk about the Eddington experiment. This is one of the projects I got to work on with Juan, uh, who also was uh, heavily involved in this as well. I'm gonna talk about this part here, but Juan was uh, instrumental in making this happen because he was in Chile and he's able to recruit students and do things I just couldn't because I'm based in Tucson. So this is something we decided to try uh, a few months before the eclipse. And uh, when Einstein published his general theory of relativity, one of the predictions is that light would not necessarily travel in straight lines a very massive object like our sun would bend space. So light would actually change direction as it went around a massive object like our sun. Um, now, of course, it was a very, very small effect. Our sun is not that massive on a cosmic scale, believe it or not. It may seem big and massive, but it's really very small. And uh, it was a very difficult predict observation to make. He predicted that that angle that the star would be bent would be about 1.7 arc seconds. Now, if you don't know what an arc second is, think back to your high school geometry class. You had your little protractor, 360 degrees in a circle. So imagine one of those little bitty degrees, take it, chop it into 60 pieces. That's an arc minute. Take one of those little 60 pieces, chop it into 60 pieces, and that's about an arc second. And the deflection is only about 1.7 arc seconds. So very, very small. But Arthur Eddington, led a couple of teams, and they actually observed this deflection in 1919, which was the first experimental evidence that Einstein's theory of relativity was correct. So this was a very groundbreaking experiment. 2019 was 100 years after that observation. So we decided, let's see if we can recreate this experiment 100 years after it was originally done. So. In 2017, we had the eclipse in the United States, and a, a man named Don Bruns, who I communicated with a couple times about this, he did some research and found the last attempt someone to make do this was 1973. Now, 73, that was when we were still using film cameras. We hadn't had digital detectors back then. So we decided he wanted to try it with digital detectors and digital cameras and see if he could improve on previous results. He took two years preparing for this, uh, selecting his equipment, testing, uh, looking for places to set up, so he spent two years meticulously preparing. Uh, he set up a lion's camp near Casper, Wyoming. He used a Telugu refracting telescope, a Finger Lakes instrument uh, camera, which is a very expensive camera, and a very advanced equatorial mount called a Bisk Mighty mount. And he, after taking everything into account, he had weather stations set up there, recording the temperature and humidity every minute. He got a result of 1.752 arc seconds, which is in excellent, excellent agreement with Einstein's predictions, which he probably has done one of the best uh, measurements of this ever done, but it took him, uh, like I said, a lot of prep and a, a lot of work to actually make this happen. So in uh, about uh, March of 2019, that's when uh, Steve Pompey, my supervisor, came to me and said, let's try this because we have an upcoming eclipse in Chile. So Don Bruns took four, uh, two years to prepare for it. We had about well, March, April, May, June, July. So we had about four months to prepare for it. So we decided to plan our own one since we had the eclipse passing directly over CTIO and the La Silla Observatory, which is a European Southern Observatory uh, one, as I believe Manuel mentioned. So we decided let's try our own version of this experiment. So we needed a telescope with good optics. That's the first thing we needed. And CTIO, we several years ago, we purchased the Nexstar 11-inch telescope for them. So we decided to use that one. Now you also need a wide field of view. 
Uh, so we actually put a hyperstar system on that to give us a nice wide field of view about 1.4 by, I think it was 1.28 uh, by 1.8 some degrees, which is a fairly large field of view for a telescope that size. We also needed a fast camera. So we want to obtain a lot of images. Uh, Don Bruns, his Finger Lake Instruments camera has what's called a readout time of about a second and a half. That means it takes a picture, the picture gets transferred to the computer in about a second and a half, and then you can take another picture. The first cameras I looked at were SBIG cameras, Santa Barbara Instrument Groups, and they had readout times of 8 to 10 seconds. Well, if you only have 128 seconds of totality at CTIO, um, and you have to wait 10 seconds between pictures, you're not going to get a lot of pictures. So we needed a much faster camera than that, so I was researching cameras. We needed a computer and software to drive the telescope and the camera, and I actually, uh, my previous work computer, my previous Mac at work was refurbed to uh, do that and a team to work on the project. So those are the things we needed before we could uh, do that. So like I said, there's the Hyperstar, we had to bust on deck with Hyperstar. The camera we set on was a ZWO 1600 Pro CMOS camera. It's a monochrome camera, black and white, very fast readout times, fractions of a second, less than a second. So we could take a picture and almost instantly take another picture. So that was the solution. And I actually uh, talked to Don Bruns. I told you I emailed him several times. And uh, he said, if I have to do this experiment again, I would choose the ZWO 1600 camera. Now he told me this after I'd already said, that's a good camera that I think we're gonna use. And he told, so he confirmed my decision, made me feel good that I did my research and my homework well. Um, and Juan recruited several students from the University of La Serena, Gabriela Bustos, Sebastian Suarez, Javier Seguera, and Anna Leone, who you can see pictured at our setup on the right on eclipse day there as we we're getting the, as, uh, telescope ready. That's our next star 11. You can see the ZWO camera hanging off the front of it. When you use the Hyperstar system, the camera is in front of the telescope like that. So that's uh, our setup on Eclipse Day, as you can see. So, and then Eclipse Day comes, and as Murphy's Law says, if something can go wrong, it will. And for some reason, the Sky Pro, the telescope and camera, those controls were not working. We could not get them to communicate on the day of the eclipse. And it was uh, obviously, it was very difficult because we had limited time. We have 128 seconds of totality to get our data. We need dozens of pictures and uh, trying to program, move the scope manually uh, would be difficult. Fortunately, I got my first Nexstar telescope in 1999, which means I know these things forward and backward. And I know how to program the coordinates into the hand control and uh, which makes things a lot faster. And I was about to do that. I grabbed the hand control, I was about to start programming it. And of course, we're in Chile, so I see the hand control all of a sudden is in Spanish mode. Unfortunately, I don't speak Spanish, so I handed it to one of the students and said, here, I'm going to tell you what to type in, and you navigate through these menus to uh, type stuff in. And we actually were able to communicate. I, he's able to translate to Spanish to English for me, and I was able to navigate through the menus and show him exactly how to do it. So the sun is low in the sky, which makes atmospheric refraction and distortion bigger issues. The sun appears to shimmer and shake, and stars appear to shimmer and shake low in the sky. The twinkling effect is more pronounced and low in the sky, which makes it more difficult to measure the uh, positions. We need an image of the field without the sun. Now, we started uh, the, the, the same star field, but with the sun not there. We didn't start soon enough to do that before the eclipse, so we had to get that a few months after the eclipse. Even once we had our data, we had to go back that field several months later and take the image without the sun there. So we also have uh, some um, procedures to register the images don't work well with stars in the solar corona. So when we're trying to process the data, the normal ways to align images and get them lined up just breaks down when you have the solar corona around your stars. So there's been a lot of challenges, but we overcame most of the, we overcame the challenges on the day up to get our data and we're still working on the data. So even a year later, the data process is very long and long and cumbersome, but we're making progress. So here's some of the data we got. This is actually one of our images. You can see the sun at the left of the screen and all the circles here. It's kind of hard to see because some of them are faint, but all those are detected stars. And of course, this is only one small part of the uh, field we took. This is just one image. We took several images going around the sun. So we actually have quite a few stars. This is just a few of the ones we have right there. Unfortunately, you can also see they're a little out of focus. If you look in the lower left, they're slightly donut shaped. So we have to find the center of the stars. Fortunately, the center of a donut should be the same as the center of the point. So we're hoping we can still pull this off and get good enough data, good, good enough uh, analysis to pull out this result. We, can see, we think that's just because there's thermal expansion. When you have the telescope heats up, it expands and actually throws the focus off a little bit. 
So next time we do this, we will, and there's going to be a next time, we hope. Uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. We'll actually focus the scope closer to totality than we did this time to give it less time to uh, expand in that. We also hope to use an electronic focuser, which will help uh, get the focus more precise as well, which we did this was manual focuser, you know, twisting the knob, but an electronic focuser, you might get a little more fine control. So the analysis is ongoing. I talked a little about the defocus images. Uh, we're trying to combine lots of images. The image I just showed you, we actually took multiple images in that field. We're gonna stack them, combine them to increase the signal to noise ratio and reduce the background noise. Uh, working on measurements uh, to, in Eclipse images with astrometry.net. And uh, the fields that were obtained in November, that same star field without the sun present, uh, it was a bit of a windy night. We're hoping that won't uh, affect those images. But of course, we can always go back and take those again. So we just need the same field without the sun there. So those images can be redone if needed. The images from the eclipse can't be redone. So uh, this is where we get to the fun part. This year, December 14th, there's another total solar eclipse in Chile. Not passing over the same part of the country, but passing over southern Chile, uh, down near Villa Rica, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Down that part of the area, you can see in the middle there, right on the right center line, about right here is Villa Rica. So very, down towards southern Chile, about south Concepcion. This one will have a couple advantages over the 2020 eclipse. The sun will be much higher in the sky, 79 point some degrees, almost 80 degrees in the sky, very high during totality. That'll reduce that atmospheric refraction effects and the uh, twinkling we had to deal with. Uh, we're also inviting other universities in Chile to participate this time, in addition to the University of La Serena, trying to get students from other universities to put together their own teams and bring their own equipment down so we can actually have multiple groups attempting to do this and find out what telescopes, what cameras, what techniques work best, because we don't expect everyone to be copying our setup and our techniques. Uh, so we're hoping to be get a lot of different results and really find out what works best. And of course, coming up in just a little of under four years now, because it's on April 8th, I believe, of 2024, there's going to be a total solar eclipse in the United States. It'll also pass through uh, Mexico, come up through Texas, Arkansas, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, New York, up through some New England states in the Northeast to brush uh, parts of Southern Canada. And we're hoping to get a whole bunch of teams to be able to do this in 2024 and give them the tools they need to succeed based on the experience we have from these two eclipses. So 2024, I'm really looking forward to. I hope that we will be able to do this experiment in uh, December, of course, with COVID. I was originally planning on traveling to Chile for it. I don't know if that's going to happen now, but I'm hoping that Juan will still be able to do it with the students from there. And even if I can't travel to Chile, I have uh, the same camera that they have in Chile. I have a Nexstar telescope here, so I can set up and uh, do testing of, uh, testing of the procedures we're going to use here and testing of our scripts and everything here in Tucson. So I hope to give them lots of support, even if I'm not there in person. But of course, if travel's permitted, I would love to be there in person too. So I think that is our last slide here. Oh yes, uh, that's our last slide here. I do want to mention before I take questions, just starting next week, uh, we'll be doing this at a different time. We're going to be rotating between Chile, Hawaii, and uh, Tucson for this event. So we will be trying to make a different, slightly different time, which works better with all our time zone differences. So starting next week, will be 4 p.m. in Chile, 1 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, and 10 a.m. Hawaii Standard Time. Hawaii and Tucson do not observe daylight savings time, so I wanted to mention that. Um, Next week's guest will be uh, Noir Lab's Dr. Connie Walker. I don't know the title of her talk yet. I suspect, given her interest, it'll be on dark skies, but there's a lot of aspects she talk about, so I'm interested to see what she's going to bring to us next week. It looks like Jamika is back, so do you have any uh, questions or comments from the chat, Jamika? Yes, I do, but uh, first I'd like to thank all three of our fantastic hosts today, Juan, Manuel, and Rob. Thank you so much for being with us today. And yes, we have a few more questions and comments. Um, first, a uh, question from Freya Hunt. Uh, Freya asks, do they know if animals were affected by the eclipse? And that's for anyone. <laughs> Well, I, I, I can't address this eclipse so much because during totality, I was kind of occupied. Um, but I will say that there was, a, in 2017, I was at an eclipse in Illinois, near Waterloo, Illinois, for totality. And I was on a farm. 
And so that one, I had lots of animals around me and I could definitely see the effects of animals. I think that I was on a small lake so I could see the ducks literally going back to their nest at night, you know, because <laughs> they were like 20 feet from me, nest getting ready to lay down in their nest for the evening as totality approached. Like I said, I was a little busier doing the Eddington experiment in CTIO, so I didn't notice the animals there as much. I don't know if anyone else did. Well, this uh, um, is one here. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, all the animals respond to the clips in different ways. Uh, uh, birds, for example, can uh, they they get back to their nest uh, at the beginning of the of the clips, and uh, when the clips end, they it's like uh, in, early in the morning, so they 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 go out. In in the case of um, of the our eclipse here in in Chile on Cerro Tololo, I saw a few birds coming back to their, uh, for example, near where the domes area are, and I saw a couple in in actually in the 1.5 meter dome, coming back and forward, trying to find their nest there, and uh, probably a little uh, confused about the situation with the eclipse, but. That's that's all that happened with with animals. No, there's no problem for them. They don't look to the to the sun. By the way, they don't need glasses or protection. <laughs> um, that's a, a usual question that we receive. Is a, we our dog need to wear glasses or our cat or something like that? No, it's 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 not needed. They they're smarter than us. They don't look to the sun. <laughs> Well, I'm also curious because uh, on CTIO near the summit, there's a family of foxes, and I remember that they frequently will um, go to the uh, near the dining hall shortly after sunset. That's when they take out trash to the dumpster, and the foxes will uh, wait for that. So I was curious if the foxes went there during the eclipse to see if there was food because it was getting dark. <laughs> but I yeah. we were up the summit, so I don't know if they did or not, but I thought about that. Yeah, um, and maybe they were a little scared about the, you know, we have a lot of people at the summit. There are 200 people with the visitors and the special guests. So maybe they they're, they're try to avoid us. <laughs> well, we have one more comment and question and then we will wrap up here. Uh, so our question is from Liz Flemings and Liz asks, Will there be a live broadcast of the December total eclipse? Juan Manuel Rob. Um, uh, not sure yet. I mean, yeah, we we know that the Exploratorium is going to done um, uh, a live broadcast from uh, Villarica area, uh, but because of COVID uh, situation. Um, the, they're still, they have a plan A, B, and C for, for the situation. But for sure, we are going to have some live uh, broadcast, hopefully from the Exploratorium. And, but depend of the COVID situation here in Chile and in the world. Of course. Thank you so much, Juan. Um, any last comments from uh, Rob or Manuel before we wrap up today's special episode on solar eclipse? I would say watch this space, as they say, because I'm sure as we get toward uh, later in the year, we'll be doing a special uh, preview of the eclipse on a li future live from NORLAB as the year progresses and gets a little closer. Fantastic. We'll do that for sure, Rob. Uh, anything else from uh, you, Manuel? No, I, I don't think so. I, I would like to just, just to say that uh, and to th uh, say thanks for inviting me to this special edition of Live from Nora Lab. So I feel very, very honored to participate in this special event. So thank you very much for inviting me. Fantastic. We'd like to thank all three of our guests again, um, Juan, Manuel, and Rob. Thank you again for joining us on today's special edition of Live from Noir Lab, Solar Eclipse Edition. So for those of you who have more questions or comments for any of our three guests, 
um, please feel free to go ahead and leave those in the comment section. And as um, Rob and I believe Juan referred to earlier, there are some videos and some images that uh, we will put also there down in the description that uh, are downloadable. I see quite a few people who uh, commented on how amazing and stunning uh, the images were and the videos were um, that you all three shared. So look out for that. Um, and how about we take it over to Manuel to uh, lead us off for tomorrow because you have uh, in La Serena, you have uh, another edition of, of this tomorrow, correct? Yes, that's, that's right. We have a special edition just in Spanish. So we invite everyone who wants to participate and we have a panel event, a virtual panel event tomorrow at um, 4 p.m. Uh, Chilean time. Uh, and we will have um, we will have the participation of Isabel Hawkins, who is uh, who, who is one of the responsible to broadcast the uh, the last I don't know probably the last ten eclipses around the world, and she will be talking about their experience uh, broadcasting eclipses around the world. So it will be very interesting. So if you if you would like to participate, we'll be very happy to um, uh, to have it to have you there. Yeah, uh, the, don't the bad news is that it, it's it's in Spanish, but <laughs> but it's a good way to learn a little bit more uh, of Spanish or another language. So you're everyone's invited. That's good. That's good news for Spanish speakers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much, and we look forward to seeing you, uh, Manuel and Juan, tomorrow. And you and our YouTube audience, we hope you will join us again next week for live from Noir Lab. Mahalo and aloha.